Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Under pressure, stocks in Asia follow the U.S. lower ahead of the crucial jobs report. Fed officials divided over the rate path this year. Neil Kashkari floating the possibility of no cuts. But Loretta Mesta suggesting the central bank is getting closer to its target. Israel agrees to open new aid routes into Gaza after a warning from President Biden. Oil extends gains with Brent pushing above $90 a barrel for the first time since October. Plus, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen starts her week-long visit to China with a warning that Chinese overcapacity in manufacturing poses risks to the global economy. And also on the show, our exclusive interview with Argentina's president, Javier Millet, as he turns from hardliner to pragmatist in relations with China. Well, a very good morning. Happy Friday. It's the day you've been waiting for all week. It's U.S. Jobs Day. Could we get the Goldilocks scenario for markets? The uh, no suggestion that the labor market's taking a serious downturn, but no excuse for the Fed to not cut rates yet. We're going to preview that data later in the hour with a special guest, the chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, Ellen Zentner, and we'll also talk all things global economy. But yesterday, in the meantime, while we were waiting for that data, we were treated to even more Fed speak. Kashkari and Mester both speaking, and you had stocks off the back of that, wiping out any gains that they had made earlier in the session. Now, however, Wall Street futures pointing to a higher opening. Not in the case of Europe, though, uh, futures down for Euro stocks 50. But if we flip over to the cross asset picture, you have got Treasury yields pretty steady on the two year uh, as we await that US jobs report later. The dollar a touch stronger. Brent, as I say, having top $90 a barrel on Netanyahu, vowing to operate against Iran and its proxies. Of course, we have had the geopolitical risks rumbling on in the background for many months now. But this perhaps is a new new threat to oil supply. These moves are all about the fear of the unknown. Just finally, a look at copper here. Uh, it has rallied to its highest in 14 months, so extending the gains that started in February in this bellwether industrial metal in response to rising supply risks. But that's what's happening in broader markets. Let's focus now on Asia. Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn is standing by for us in Dubai. Vonnie, what's happening? Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, the same risk aversion percolating through Asia markets. We're off our lows now for the MXAP, and we're still down about eight-tenths of a percent for the Asia-Pacific Index. The Hang Seng reopened after the holiday yesterday. Bear in mind, mainland China and Taiwan still closed today, but the Hang Seng didn't play catch-up. It's down four-tenths of one percent. Property companies really dragging on the Hang Seng. Also, chip companies, interestingly enough, because we got some good news from a chip company that I'll tell you about in a moment. But there again, we have the Hang Seng down. China continues to be closed. This is just a reaction to all of the risk aversion that really began in the afternoon session in the United States on Thursday. The Nikkei 225 down 2.1%. We had a little bit of extra strength in the yen after Governor Ueda came out and said, you know, perhaps, well, he didn't specifically say that rate hikes might start earlier, but what he said was the wage hike will be impacting from maybe June, July. And so that had traders thinking that perhaps that next interest rate increase could come somewhere between July and October, as opposed to what they had been thinking, which was that it would be pushed out more towards the October time frame. The cost be down 1%. This is interesting because Samsung came out and basically f f signaled a profit for the quarter. We'll get full results at the end of the month, but the actual uh, signaling is in already that they returned to profit. Memory chip prices have been up for the last seven months and it's finally showing in Samsung's results. So it is interesting to see the cost be down. Samsung itself is also down. So you can just see how risk aversion is just absolutely permeating these markets. If we take a look at currencies, it's a little bit obvious too. You can see that there's a safe haven bid. The dollar index, the Bloomberg dollar index is strengthening just a little bit. The yen hit 151.81 after those comments, back down to 151.19 now. So a little strength for the yen. The yuan continues to be a little bit troublesome. It's still trading very close 
close to the weekend of its 2% band. And then I did want to point out the rupee because in India, we just had uh, the Reserve Bank of India hold rates pat. Now, that was as expected. We were expecting that the RBI would hold rates at 6.5%. Governor Shaktikant Das, though, did come out and say that food price inflation is a little bit troublesome, very volatile, but that they will be keeping a very close eye on it, and that he thinks that consumption can hold up India's economy, which, bear in mind, is growing close to about 8% now, and we are headed into elections. So it's a, quite a volatile time for the country. Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn in Dubai, we thank you. And we're going to stay in Asia now because U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is there. She's in China. She's on her latest visit. It's her second trip to China in nine months. And she's got a pledge to work towards better economic ties. She's also warned, though, that Chinese overcapacity in manufacturing poses risks for the rest of the world economy. So for analysis, let's bring in Bloomberg's Bill Ferries. Bill, what are we hearing so far from Yellen? And how is her message likely to be received? Well, you summed it up very well there. She's, uh, she's showing up here with this message that uh, the two economies, the two countries can work together. And uh, the fact that she's there on her second trip uh, in just nine months is a turnaround from where we were, say, a year ago when we went almost an entire year without the two sides, uh, senior leaders from the two sides talking at all. So her visit is a sign that uh, the communication channels are open, but she is showing up with a very much a mixed message, saying on the one hand the economies can work together, but on the other hand raising a lot of concerns about what U.S. officials are calling Chinese uh, industrial overcapacity. And they're trying to bring uh, other countries in on that message, speaking to foreign business leaders on this trip as well. Uh, she is uh, emphasizing concerns the U.S. has about clean energy, We're talking about EVs, uh, solar panels, things like that, and uh, saying that uh, with China's slowing economy, their focus on exporting uh, these kind of products to the rest of the world could actually end up doing some damage to industries abroad. And Bill, when she's talking about China's overcapacity, what's it likely to mean for the U.S.-China relationship in the months ahead? Behind the scenes, do you reckon they're talking about tariffs? Well, that's what we've heard uh, even earlier this week when President Biden and President Xi spoke. The U.S. side says they raised uh, the potential of uh, it, more tariffs coming in. I think that's something uh, Janet Yellen's trip may be laying the groundwork for. We have uh, already done some reporting about uh, additional restrictions on things like uh, semiconductor technology. So uh, while she is there talking uh, quite a bit about the, the, the potential in the relationship, there is a message that seems to be delivered that's going to cause some consternation on the Chinese side. All right, Bill Ferries, we thank you for that. As we await uh, U.S. Tre Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking at an AmCham event there over in China. But let's get back to the main event of the day, the March U.S. jobs report. It's out later. It's likely to offer us some insight into the Fed's next moves. Now, expectations are for declines in both the top-line non-farm payrolls figure and the unemployment rate. And it follows the latest weekly jobless claims data, which topped estimates. But we have in the meantime been treated to some Fed speak. We've heard from Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari calling for patience on rate cuts. I wouldn't say they're off the table, but they're also not a likely scenario given what we know right now. If we continue to see strong job growth, if we continue to see strong consumer spending and strong GDP growth, then that raises a question in my mind, well, why would we cut rates? I still think if you take a longer arc, inflation's coming down, and we're going to get to 2%. Let's bring in Mark Hudmore, Bloomberg's M Live executive editor. Morning, Mark. Uh, let's just focus first on the non-farm payrolls number, shall we? So we've got the whisper number at 233K, above the consensus, consensus figure of 214K. But then you had the ISM employment survey figures weaker. So what are you expecting? Uh, good morning, Lizzie. If I was going to take out my darts to throw at the dartboard, I'd actually go for a slightly softer number today. I think what is interesting about this jobs number is that for the first time in a long time, maybe even a couple of years, I think we're probably skewed for a negative markets reaction. Um, normally, we've actually gone into these, these jobs reports in the last year or so where we've been skewed for a positive reaction and a surprise in either direction. But we've run a long way in the market on the idea that of a dovish Fed despite a strong economy. And we're getting closer to the point where the market has to kind of face the idea that, hey, wait a sec, we're either not going to get rate cuts 
or the economy is in much more trouble than we think. And so a surprise in either direction today might actually be bad for the stock market and the stock market will only do okay if it's an inline number. OK, and there, unemployment rate, you can see it on the screen, the estimate for 3.8%. Mark, at the last Fed meeting, you had Powell using his opening statement to say that a surprise on this number could prompt a Fed cut. What level of unemployment do you reckon we'd need to see to trigger a May cut? I think it's going to have to be at least 4%, but I'm not even sure that would do it in May. Look, I know Powell wants to cut, but I think it's going to take more than one data point to suddenly change the narrative. Now, we have time before the May meeting, but I think that's looking pretty unlikely at the moment unless we have a severe uh, change in the data. Uh, so, you know, at the moment... I think we've got to be talking about in line with Kashkari, who I should emphasize is not a voter this year. Uh, I'm completely in line with him, but he isn't you know, that relevant because he doesn't vote and he's a known hawk. But I don't know why we'd be cutting unless we see a severe deterioration in the data. Yes, a 4% unemployment print would suddenly get people thinking about that narrative, but we'd need a few more data prints to then suddenly confirm a May cut. Mark, you talked about the potential market reaction. Do you think you would see a bigger repricing if it was a very strong print or a very weak print? Yeah, it's a, it's a really big question. I actually think we get the much bigger reaction in yields if, if, it's, a, if it's a strong print again today. Um, I think, you know, look, the market is refusing to, to kind of turn away from the idea that we're going to get Fed cuts this year. But really, there's no justification out there for it yet. Uh, we're all kind of thinking that there might be some secret hidden cracks in the economy that are suddenly going to uh, widen or blow up. And so I think that if we get a, you know, a weak number of people will suddenly stay with that narrative that, hey, cuts are coming in because the economy is in trouble. So therefore, the bigger reaction, the asymmetric reaction, is if we get a strong print today, it again bashes that idea in the head that we should be getting any Fed cuts. And really, we're having all this debate of whether we get two or three cuts. Why should we be cutting at all uh, you know, when the economy is not rolling over just yet? The consumer is still strong. The labor market is still strong, which is what a strong print today would imply. So I think, yes, for yields, the asymmetric reaction is a strong number. I think for stock markets, I think it just wants to be in line for stock markets to do OK. All right, Mark Hudmore with a preview of the U.S. jobs report later. We thank you. I know you'll be watching it closely throughout the day, but we have got plenty more else on the docket to keep us busy. So at 7 a.m. London time, top of the hour, we're going to get German factory orders. And the consensus expectation is for growth on a monthly basis, but not on the year. Then at 1.30 p.m. UK time, as I say, it's the main event, the U.S. jobs report. If, as we, if we see unemployment rising above 4%, does it put a May cut on the table? Big question. Mark, not so sure uh, whether even 4% could do it. Then at 5 p.m. London time, uh, though, of course, you might be in the pub by then. It's Russian GDP. Economists expecting a tick down on an annual basis to 5.3% growth in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, but we will be across all of that data throughout the day. And to get you up to speed, ready for your day, don't forget to check out the Daybreak newsletter. D-A-Y-B, go, is where you'll find it on the terminal. We can cross now to Janet Yellen. She is speaking at an AmCham event in China. The U.S. Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Partners in AmCham Shanghai and AmCham South China for working with us to help bring everyone together. You know, the ambassador talked about the important channel was opened by, by Secretary Yellen. But I think like many of you, one of the ways you gauge what's happening in China is by what's coming across your region. Now, of course, the point of this trip is to strengthen the U.S.-China economic relationship, but in a healthier way, as Bill Ferries was mentioning. Janet Yellen has talked about the importance of not decoupling, but she's also raised concerns about massive Chinese state investment. So how will she strike this balance in these remarks now? After these comments, she's scheduled uh, to meet the Chinese economic policy czar, Vice Prime Minister. Uh, he Lung, Li Feng, he, Li Feng, along with his predecessor Liu He, who analysts say retains influence in China. So two important conversations for Yellen to be having today. She's building on that phone call between President Biden and Xi earlier in the week. And then, of course, she's setting the foundations for another visit from Secretary of State Antony Blinken that we are to expect in the coming weeks. But, of course, a crucial moment for the U.S.-China relationship. Tensions 
high at the moment, of course, focused very much on tech, TikTok in particular, the potential US ban, as we have seen, and Janet Yellen taking to the stage now. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to the American Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak to American businesses here in Guangzhou at the start of my visit. This city holds a unique position in Chinese economic history. It was key to Chinese trade for centuries. And in fact, at the start of the US-China trade, with the sh first ship from the newly independent United States docking at Guangzhou in 1784. Then Guangzhou was at the heart of the market-oriented reforms and industrial development that drove China's tremendous growth. And it was a key stop on Deng Xiaoping's 1992 Southern Tour when he renewed China's commitment to these reforms. Today, as all of you know well, Guangzhou remains the top destination for foreign investment in China, including from Fortune Global 500 companies. It's a fitting place for me to emphasize the strong economic ties between the United States and China, and the benefits that these ties can bring for both the US and Chinese economies. I'd also like to touch on concerns, concerns that I've heard from American businesses, which I intend to discuss with my Chinese counterparts this week. Well, let me start with the importance of the US-China economic relationship. One year ago, I laid out our administration's approach to China, outlining three key objectives. The United States will pursue a healthy economic relationship with China. We will seek to cooperate with China on global challenges. And we will deploy our economic tools when needed and in a narrowly targeted manner to protect our national security and that of our allies, as well as human rights. President Biden and I firmly reject the idea that the United States should decouple from China. A full economic separation is neither practical nor desirable, as both the US and China have affirmed in public statements following our high-level bilateral meetings. Indeed, America's economic strategy is centered around investing in our economic strength. Over the past three years, our administration's policies have helped drive an historic economic recovery and laid the foundation for long-term economic growth. We're also deepening our ties with allies and partners around the world while continuing to pursue the broad swath of economic activities between the US and China that can benefit both countries. Our conviction in the importance of a healthy economic relationship is rooted in an understanding of the roles that the United States and China play in the global economy. Together, the US and China represent 40% of global GDP. We have the world's largest financial systems. Countries around the world watch both of our economies but also our interactions as they're crucial to global growth. The US is China's largest trading partner, and China is the United States' third largest trading partner following Canada and Mexico. With a large and growing middle class, China represents a huge market for American manufacturers and other firms, including those represented in this room. Exports to China, from transportation equipment to integrated circuits, support over 700,000 American jobs, and Chinese companies employ additional American workers. Put simply, the U.S.-China bilateral economic relationship is among the most important in the world. Responsibly managing it is essential. 
At President Biden's direction, we've taken steps over the last two years that have put the U.S.-China economic relationship on much surer footing. One of my key priorities has been to establish resilient communication channels between the U.S. and China, which I've done through engagements with my counterparts at home and in China. We launch and hold regular meetings of the economic and financial working groups, bringing together policy teams from both our countries to discuss key aspects of our relationship, from monitoring economic and financial risks to identifying and pursuing areas of potential cooperation. For areas where we disagree, communication helps prevent misunderstanding from leading to unintended escalation and allows us to frankly convey concerns. It's in this spirit of continuing to move the U.S.-China relationship in a constructive direction that I'd like to share my concerns about the business environment in China and the ability of American firms to compete on a level playing field. I've heard from many American business executives that operating in China can be challenging. I understand that the Chamber's recent survey found that one-third of American firms in China report experiencing unfair treatment compared to local competitors. We've seen the PRC pursue unfair economic practices, including imposing barriers to access for foreign firms and taking coercive actions against American companies. I strongly believe that this doesn't only hurt these American firms. Ending these unfair practices would benefit China by improving the business climate here. And I intend to raise these issues in meetings this week. I know that American businesses are also concerned about the so we're dressing down for China from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen there speaking in Guangzhou at an AmCham event. She is trying to strengthen ties between the two countries, uh, but it's a crucial moment. This is one of the last few opportunities to strengthen those ties before the U.S. election, which is, of course, becoming a bit of a battle to who can be tougher on China. But Janet Yellen there chiding the Chinese government for what she called the unfair treatment of American and other foreign and companies also calling on Beijing to return to the pro-market reforms of the past saying that Chinese capacity is more than the, the global economy can bear over capacity from China really becoming problematic now so we will keep across the rest of her four-day visit to the country but coming up on the program Europe has swapped Russian LNG for the supply from the US we'll bring you a deep dive into Europe's natural gas outlook and what it means for the energy transition. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our weekly deep dive into the green energy transition. Europe's made it through winter with record gas storage levels and vastly reduced reliance on Russian pipeline gas, pivoting instead to using US LNG supply and cleaner energy resources. For analysis, I'm joined now by Irina Sereda, head of Bloomberg NEF's European gas team. Irina, lovely to have you. Is Europe prepared for when the Russian-Ukraine transit agreement expires later this year? Yes, indeed, Europe may face a complete cutoff of Russian pipeline supplies, so the market is currently closely watching any developments. Russian pipeline supplies via Ukraine currently cover about 5% of total EU gas demand, so the region has already diversified its supply sources. 
Now, European Union has made it clear that it is unlikely that they would be willing to renegotiate Russian transit deal. And Ukraine has also dismissed this opportunity multiple times. However, what remains unclear whether Ukraine would be open for any other arrangements as certain countries like Austria and Slovakia, for example, they are still heavily relying on Russian supplies. So potentially they can get Russian gas on the eastern border of Ukraine and then arrange transportation independently. And is the market pricing in the uncertainty over the future of Russian gas transits by Ukraine? Yeah, I would say that a complete cutoff of Russian supplies would trigger gas price spikes as market remains sensitive to any supply losses. However, European gas prices have come down quite significantly over the past six months and they are getting closer to pre-energy crisis levels. This is on the back of record high gas storage levels across Europe as the region has already exited winter season. However, looking at the forward curve, you can see that uh, winter gas prices are higher, are lower for the next winter compared to the previous one. However, it's still remaining historically high. As Europe became more reliant on, reliant on global LNG uh, market, it, is, has, it has to compete with Asian markets as well. Okay, really interesting. Irina Sereda, head of Bloomberg NEF's European Gas Team, we thank you for that. And coming up next, a crucial conversation. We'll speak to Morgan Stanley Chief US Economist Ellen Zentner, joining us from the Ambrosetti Forum in Cernobio, in Italy, Lake Como. Stay with us for that conversation. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Verdon in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Under pressure, stocks in Asia follow the U.S. lower ahead of the crucial jobs report. Fed officials divided over the rate path this year. Neil Kashkari floating the possibility of no cuts, but Loretta Mesta suggesting the central bank is getting closer to its target. Israel agrees to open new aid routes into Gaza after warning from President Biden. Oil extends gains with Brent pushing above $90 a barrel for the first time since October. Plus, we'll bring you our exclusive interview with Argentina's President Javier Millet as he turns from hardliner to pragmatist in relations with China. Well, happy Friday. Welcome to Jobs Day. It's the moment you've been waiting for. Could this report deliver the markets the, the Goldilocks scenario where there's no excuse but to cut rates, but you still have a labour market that's not taking too serious a downturn. That's what markets are looking for. Could we even see an unemployment number that bounces the Fed into cutting rates in May? We'll talk about that next. But in the meantime, we were treated to even more Fed speak. We heard from Kashkari and Mester, and that wiped out any gains that the S&P had made in the session yesterday. Futures now, though, stateside pointing to a higher opening, though they aren't this side of the Atlantic. Euro stocks 50 futures down 1.4%. If we flip over to the cross-asset picture, you've got the two-year Treasury yield lower a basis point at 4.63%. The dollar is a touch stronger there. Brent crude now at $91 a barrel. Just above it, actually, on these comments uh, from Netanyahu on I Iran. And finally, copper rallying to its highest in 14 months. So extending the gains that started in February. Uh, this really a bellwether industrial metal. And it's in response to the rising supply risks. But let's get back to the Fed and its impact on the markets. Stocks in Asia uh, have been lower today, following on from that 1.2% drop in yesterday's S&P session. This ahead of the jobs report from the US later today and as a rally in oil triggered the flight to the safest corners of the market. Well, joining us now is Morgan Stanley, Chief US Economist Ellen Zentner, joining us from Ambrosetti Forum in Chernobyl. Italy. Lovely to see you, Ellen, with the beautiful Lake Como behind you. How lucky we are to have you in Europe on US Jobs Day. And let's start there, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, I wish you were sort here of with me. Unemployment... <laughs> me too. What sort of unemployment rate are you looking for to get the Fed to cut rates in May? So I think it, it's going to be more about inflation if the Fed were to cut as early as May. I think the bar is very high for them to go that soon, though. Um, but I do still expect them to be ready by June. 
For the employment report, you know, we're expecting another big number, around 245,000. Even if it comes in at 100, 150,000, they'll say it's just one print. Um, we're going to look at the unemployment rate. I think even if we get a very strong jobs number, we're going to keep the unemployment rate higher at 3.9 percent. And that's because so many people are coming into the labor market. And then you're still going to get wage pressures that are coming off. So when you talk about a Goldilocks scenario, right, that's going to be a report that says the economy is still strong, but it's not something that gives a definitive signal to the Fed that they need to cut very soon here. Well, Chair Powell agrees with you that it's a bigger economy, not a tighter one, thanks to immigration. But you've put the neutral jobs rate of growth at 265,000 a month. Why is Powell's estimate of 100,000 wrong? So, look, I had an estimate of 100,000 just six months ago. Um, essentially, we've gotten new data, and this is something that markets have to deal with, economists have to deal with. We have gotten significantly upward revisions to population growth in the U.S. And faster population growth means faster economy, it means faster growth in the labor market, and it also means that you're going to have a higher, what we call break-even level for employment, the amount of jobs you need to create in order to keep the unemployment rate steady. And so this is a supply side story. That supply side story is something that Chair Powell has been focused on since later last year. 2023 was all about improving supply chains, improving labor supply. 2024 extends that labor supply improvement where the growth in the population uh, is just that strong. And so this is a real supply side story that is supporting growth in the economy without creating inflationary pressures. I want to come back to where rates will go in a moment, but just staying on immigration, Ellen, it's going to be a key issue, of course, in the U.S. election. If you get Trump 2.0, what sort of economic impact are you expecting? So I do think that this puts the administration in a sticky spot because, according to our surveys, uh, households uh, list immigration as the second most concern just behind inflation. Yet from an economist's just objective lens on the economy, faster population growth drives faster growth in the economy. And so it is a positive for the U.S. economy. It's been a positive for U.S. job gains. It's been a positive for U.S. consumption. But immigration itself is a hot button political issue. And so I think focusing on just the economic benefits from it will be something that, that needs to be separated on the campaign trail. But then what's the flip side of that? If you have less immigration, could Im inflation strike again? Well, I think that, that you know, the, there is a question mark out there as to how much do immigrants I, uh, contribute to inflation in the economy. Now the, now, the U.S. is very different than other economies where we have low-skilled labor coming in. They're helping fill jobs that are the positions that are open where we need labor. And they come in at, at uh, low-wage paying service sector areas of the economy that help bring wage pressures down. So that tends to not be inflationary in the U.S. That is very unlike countries like our neighbor Canada, where they have very high-skilled immigration coming in, 30 percent of their labor market is unionized. Those are high-skilled labor, and there's a lot of household formation and a lot of inflationary pressures that come from that. So the U.S. is quite different there. Um, now, that said, it's more of a, an economic growth rather than inflation problem if you were to have a shift in policy, you have a big drop off in immigration, and suddenly you have a very big slowdown in population growth, then that is more of a growth uh, narrative dampening growth and dampening inflation. So immigration is neither here nor there. It's neither inflationary nor deflationary for the immigration that we have today. But if we were to suddenly turn that off, then you would have an impact to growth and a gravitational pull on inflation as well. Ellen, we were just listening to Janet Yellen speaking in China. She's uh, talking about the issue of Chinese overproduction creating distortions. Do you agree with that concern? So I think that there's, there's, this has been a lingering concern uh, across many administrations uh, that, that, you know, it's all about the global balance of supply and demand. And there is a risk always when a country like China that is so big 
uh, exports of what they call product dumping, right? Exports uh, in a way that, that creates deflationary pressures in goods prices or creates unfair competition, unfair advantage. And this is something that many administrations have been focused on. It's something that, that will be front and center uh, during a U.S. election year. And so I think this is something where the administration is there out in front of it reminding mm. uh, folks that we do have a hard stance on China. If we can come back to the monetary, you're in the beautiful uh, Lake Como area in Italy. If the ECB cuts before the Fed, how much, is, how much divergence would be a problem? I don't think that's a problem at all. Look, the Fed is on a track to cut rates. And not all on the FOMC agree that rates will be appropriate this year. Uh, but all but one believe that we will cut rates this year in the U.S. Uh, and so that market expectation of about three cuts this year, I think, is in line with the Fed's view. And I do think that that's in line with what the Fed thinks it will deliver. We expect four cuts. We actually expect them to speed up cuts in the fourth quarter of the year because we have inflation coming down faster at that point than the Fed. Um, but I don't think that the, the timing of when central banks globally are cutting is really going to be an issue for the Fed. Markets already have cuts priced in as an expectation. Well, the last thing any central banker in the world wants to do is to reverse course. Who do you think is most at risk of a U-turn? Well, I think that uh, you know the Fed is, has communicated that it will cut. Um, it's likely to cut. Real rates are already quite restrictive, and you don't want them to get further restrictive if inflation continues to fall. So the risk there, of course, is inflation doesn't fall. Uh, if this immigration story provides so much strength in the economy and it starts to become inflationary, right, then it's not necessarily, it's, it's reversing course in a sense from we were set to cut and then we're not going to cut. I think the bar is just too high to get to a point where they're going to be willing to start hiking again. Um, but I think the strength of the U.S. economy really stands apart on the global stage at this point. So there is, there is that risk that Kashkari pointed out that they don't cut at all. But I don't see anything in the forward-looking data that suggests they should not stay on this cutting track. Okay, that's really interesting. You're going to be meeting your colleagues from around the world there today. I wonder, Ellen, what's the one global economic challenge that's keeping you up at night? So I do think it's these, I keep coming back to immigration. I cannot talk about the U.S. or global outlook without talking about immigration. I think immigration is front and center because these are tectonic shifts that we're seeing around the global economy with very different implications globally. I was having a conversation with uh, colleagues at the Bank of England last night about it. Very interesting differences in immigration between the U.K. and the U.S. I mentioned Canada earlier. I also think we do have to keep an eye on China. China has not done as much uh, stimulus as our economists there had been calling for. You need targeted stimulus toward Chinese households in order to stimulate that side of their economy. And of course, if you get into a debt deflation cycle in China, that is going to impact uh, the global economy. All right, Morgan Stanley, Chief U.S. Economist Ellen Zentner, lovely to speak to you today. Lovely to get your thoughts, especially on immigration, its impact on inflation and the Fed rate path from here. That's Ellen Zentner at the Ambrosetti Forum at Lake Como in Italy. And we're going to have plenty more interviews from there later throughout the morning. We'll have conversations with Mohamed El Arian, Tina Fordham and Nouriel Rubini coming up for you. So don't miss those. We'll also later this hour have an exclusive interview with the Argentinian president Javier Millet as he strikes a more pragmatic tone on China after previously calling the country an assassin. What a change of events. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, the Argentinian president, Javier Millet, is striking a more pragmatic tone when it comes to China. Just six months ago, he'd threatened to curb ties, calling the Asian nation, nation an assassin. But Millet spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, 
and he changed his tune. As for the Chinese government, what we've always said is that we are libertarians. And if people want to do business with China, they can carry on business as usual. What I said was that I wouldn't be aligning with communists. Um, and that's precisely one of the things. Who did I say I was going to align with? The United States and Israel. Do you have any doubt that that's my alignment, United States and Israel? No, but in fact, you have a very good, very good example at the moment, and I'll come back to Israel and the United States later. But now, as you know, in Argentina, the focus is on a Chinese space station in Patagonia that your predecessor allowed to get built. The US says that the space station has military purposes. Um, will you close it down? Well, the point is this. Negotiations are beginning to uh, audit and inspect that, because the Chinese say that is not the case. So we will move towards a situation, we will be looking at that, so that is not a problem either. Is a, is a factor in this the fact that you have that $18 billion currency swap line with China, which you do need, you need it for the reserves at the, at the central bank, it's a big portion. Does that influence your thinking on China? That situation has to do with an agreement that was entered into and which has to do with the trade exchanges between countries. I won't modify trade exchanges because I think they are trade exchanges between privates. Just as we have a part in our central bank, uh, they have, of course, their uh, central bank counterpart. I don't see a problem. And honestly, the uh, trade relations haven't changed. Not a problem. The problem would be if I was the Chinese government and, I, and, and you called me an assassin, I might be less keen to renew the currency line. Have trade relations changed? They haven't. Not one bit. So that is actually counterfactual. There's no truth. Argentinian President Javier Milei speaking there with our exclusively with our Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. And that interview forms the basis of today's Bloomberg big take on the Argentinian president's softer stance on China. Let's bring in Jill Desis, our news editor in Hong Kong, for analysis. Jill, this to me sounds like a moderation of Milei's stance on China before he was elected. How has Beijing been playing this relationship? Yes, uh, well, Lizzie, I think what you're seeing there is Malay coming to terms with something of reality that many in South America, <laughs> including um, Bolsonaro and Brazil, have uh, come to terms with already, which is that China is an incredibly important player, incredibly important toward investments. I mean, you just uh, heard John Micklethwaite there cite uh, that $18 billion swap line. Um, that's the largest source of foreign reserves in Argentina's central bank's coffers. So uh, certainly one that you can't really afford to just ignore or ultimately torpedo in favor of a harder line stance on Beijing. I mean, look, I think that at this point, it's important to mention that, you know, China's been building these inroads, uh, not just in Argentina, but throughout South America for, for quite some time. And you're seeing that materialize in the forms of really, really important um, export lines, um, particularly when it comes to food and agriculture and also uh, lithium, uh, which is incredibly important for, for China to, to build out its battery output. Um, but then also, you know, you're you're seeing this um, come into play with FX. You're seeing this come into play in all kinds of different economic issues. So, yes, I mean, not a relationship that Argentina can really shy away from. Yeah, exactly why Janet Yellen earlier saying you can't decouple from China. But on the flip side, Jill, how important is Argentina to China in its broader investments in Latin America? It is, uh, Argentina is really important to China. I mean, so uh, just a couple of years ago in 2022, Argentina signed on to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. This is that trillion dollar proposal to really kind of create all of these major economic and trade links. Originally, China had intended for Europe to get involved in that as well. Hasn't been as successful. So it's really become an important part of how China's built up a lot of influence across the global south in particular. So that's, I think, where that comes into play. Um, but then, yes, ultimately, as uh, we were just talking, 
talking about trade when it comes to China and Argentina is incredibly important. Um, China um, needs uh, soybeans from Argentina to help feed its pig supply, its pig stock. Um, and then again, I think that lithium trade is also incredibly important as it um, feeds into uh, batteries and advanced tech. So certainly some really, really big um, bits of economic ties for there for China to consider as well. Really interesting. Bloomberg's Jill Desis, thank you for that. And we'll have much more from that exclusive conversation between Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, and the Argentinian president, Javier Millet, including his views on Israel and the US, coming up later on Bloomberg TV online and on the terminal as well. Subscribers can get more right now at NI Big Take Go. But for some other stories making news today, Bloomberg has learned that senior U.S. officials plan to visit the Netherlands next week to pressure the government to toughen its chip equipment curbs with China. Washington is pushing allies to further tighten restrictions on access to technology, including urging the Netherlands to stop ASML from servicing and repairing sensitive chip making equipment. In other stories, a proxy advisory firm is telling shareholders to vote against Goldman Sachs's pay plan, which saw lofty raises for executives despite weaker profits. Glass Lewis cited the significant disconnect between pay and performance at Goldman. The bank had boosted CEO David Solomon's pay by 24% to $31 million in a year when the bank's earnings plunged by a similar amount. And Kristalina Gorgieva is poised to win a second five-year term running the International Monetary Fund. The nomination period closed on Wednesday with no other candidates put forward. The fund says its 24-member board will now hold meetings with Gorgieva and the aim is to complete the process by the end of April. Elsewhere, Joe Lewis, the 87-year-old British billionaire who pleaded guilty to insider trading, has been spared jail time by a federal judge in New York. At a hearing yesterday, Lewis was sentenced to three years probation and a $5 million fine. An attorney for Lewis said that any incarceration would be, quote, catastrophic. Lewis had admitted passing share tips to his private pilots and a girlfriend. Well, we'll have plenty more still on the programme, so do stay with us. This is Bloomberg. I still think if you take a longer arc, inflation's coming down, and we're going to get to 2%. We're not where we need to be. Inflation is still too high, particularly for the Alice communities, the asset-limited uh, communities and income constraint. If you think of food, shelter, transportation costs, still too high. We're working, it, but it's coming down, and it's coming down in a way where it is still creating jobs in America. I wouldn't say they're off the table, but they're also not a likely scenario, given what we know right now. If we continue to see strong job growth, if we continue to see strong consumer spending and strong GDP growth, then that raises a question in my mind, well, why would we cut rates? So lots more Fed speak for us to digest there. Crucially, Kashkari saying that potentially there could be no rate cuts this year. But a different message there from Mester uh, that the Fed is close to confidence levels to cut rates. So lots to pass, but also in the data as well. Of course, we've got the jobs report coming later. Traders very confused. Look at the VIX, this measure of volatility. It's uh, it's. Uh, at a one-year high, as you can see on this chart. Why so much volatility at the moment? Uh, why so much volatility as we head into the jobs report? Well, the numbers have been confusing. The last three months have seen over 200,000 jobs added each report. The unemployment rate has still moved to a two-year high. So it's a mixed message about the strength of the jobs market. If you get unemployment at 4%, could it bounce the Fed into a May cut? Ellen Zentner at Morgan Stanley tells us probably not, as does Mark Cudmore. But we will watch that number later on today, the crucial economic data of the week. But we've got plenty more for you to come on Bloomberg this morning. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is going to join the surveillance team for a live interview following the Alliances Summit in Brussels. That interview is at 12.30 p.m. UK time. But up next, it's Markets Today. Kriti Gupta and Guy Johnson are waiting for you. They'll be with you next. This is Bloomberg.